1918, brother versus brother, brother against brother, not spy versus spy. Uh, hey. So, like I said, this was a review copy. I have to get that out of the way right away. A preview copy, as the case is. Actually, it's a really fine preview copy. Okay. Not used to getting uh, copies of anything anymore, but I'm also not used to getting uh, preview copies of this, you know, higher quality. It's usually high quality print and play. This seems to. You know, it'd be close to like a game crafter quality in a lot of ways. That a really deck of good cards, uh, the counters, real counters. <laughs> and I guess the best I can say about that, because you still don't know, you know, what the final product's going to look like. At least they're trying, you know, to create the the image for me of what the final product's going to be. And I have to say I'm impressed, you know, <laughs> if this is what they, they put together for a, for, for, uh, a preview, um, I can only expect that they have an equivalent, at least as good a view of what the final copy is. And there's obviously, you know, issues where you can see, yeah, this is, you know, like with the, uh, the way the box is assembled, you know, it's, it was obviously done uh, as a special case with the, the wrapper kind of, you know, put on manually instead of the machine printing or whatever, which they probably will be getting, but who knows. All right. So if we're talking about components, we might as well talk about them. And I'm going to try to catch the points that I got throughout the game uh, in terms of components, in terms of rules, in terms of everything in a summation. But one thing to realize, this is not a final edition. The rules say draft on them for a reason. Uh, the game's in Kickstarter, but it is almost ready. But it does have a few little, uh, mainly production issues that I want to highlight. Um, for one thing, the board. Uh, it's sparse. That's okay. It's a little crowded, but... Uh, Again, that could, that's functional with everything except for these guys who are just too big for it. Uh, I think they need to rethink these and make them smaller. I hope that they do. This area here is just such a tiny printing. Um, I'm thinking there's a lot of room. These boxes are huge. And I guess you could use that space to stack up reinforcements or something in. But the reinforcements are mostly presented elsewhere. I don't think there's really a need for, for that much extra space. If these guys could be blown up a little bit, maybe pushed down a little bit over, uh, that would help a lot with the readability, especially here, but even with the charts. And this is especially important because, at least for this copy, the charts give you the setup and nothing else. The combat tables and such not are on it. Now, that would be a huge plus if you could, you know, if they're going to give uh, two charts anyway, double printing. I don't know how much the extra that costs. We can talk about some places where maybe they could save some money too. Um, there is at least one thing on the setup that I would like to see, which is the reinforcements are listed here. Um, what's not listed here is certain of the cards. Moment two, certain of the cards are um, you must start this turn with this card for, for given players. Um, just give them an option that allows them the historical uh, interventions for the most part. Uh, is that right? The train's coming, the German's coming, and there was one other. Uh, and only one. The trains and the Germans come in, and then the first turn of the game, you get all the cards that are available to you at that point, which is only three cards per side. That's one of the interesting facets of this. Um, I can't really talk about the card quality. These seem fine, but, you know, again, you don't know what the final thing is going to be. Um, 
The cards all enter the game in a certain month. And some of the cards leave the game once they're played for the event. That's pretty standard uh, in, in, in the CDG world. Um, but I've never seen one where all the cards kind of are added to the deck slowly. And that allows you to uh, more tightly constrain what the historical options might be. I don't. I never felt like I was scripted by that entry. Um, other games have, yeah, add these cards on this turn and these cards on that turn. For this game, every single turn has its own set of cards. That's not all you get. They get added to your deck. So your options just keep growing. Now, uh, first turn of the game, you only have three cards. They're pre-programmed. They're completely known. There are still different vectors the game can go into on that first turn though. There's no guarantee that someone's going to play given cards in a given way and that they're going to, you know, there's different strategies you can take as, uh, as determined by, you know, the board itself, uh, where you want to make your stand as the white player, how, how far you can keep your sphere without being crushed back in my playthrough. I felt like I may have given up too much ground, but I also felt like it would have been very, very hard for me to give up less. <laughs> um, for the counters, like I said, these guys are a little too big. Um, there are plenty of counters in this game. Way more than I ended up needing. And it may be that this is the maximum possible amount you can need, which means that you know, if people aren't fighting at all, you might need that many. I'm not even sure, though. Uh, if people aren't fighting, they're not going to move their position at all, uh, or much. So, I don't know if there's room on the board for this many counters under any reasonable circumstance. And that might be somewhere where they could get rid of, you know, um, maybe merge counter sheets. Uh, but I, I, I found at least one of my counter sheets untouched. I think this one, other than some forts from it. Uh, but there certainly are a lot of counters available. Do you need that many? Well, maybe. Um, because the reinforcements are based on board position. So uh, it's possible that the number of strategic towns that a player has might bring more counters into play. It's possible the cards can bring more counters into play. So if people are very non-violent and I don't know, the board is all in one player's hands largely. You may see one or the other of the counter mixes getting very, very heavily used. I suspect if that's the case, it's pretty much such a blowout that you probably want to call the game at that point. But I, on one playthrough, I can't make any guarantees of that. It did seem like there might have been too many counters. That's not a bad thing by any means, but it does increase the cost of, of, of the product and might be a place where you know some savings can be made. <laughs> Maybe. Um, there were some cases with some of the cards. And I know I'm focusing on components, and this is kind of ridiculous because I don't have the final components. There were some cases with cards, though. I guess I just want to hammer these in because I know that one of the reasons for me doing this is, you know, for suggestions and advice. Um, some of, some of the cards were translated directly into English so that map locations didn't match the locations on the map board. Um, I think it would be best not to anglicize the names of places that are specified on the board. Uh, but what value that is. And the same would go if that's in the rules as well. I don't remember getting flummoxed by that, but it's possible. Oh, they've got like the Puri. Here, which is V Borg on those cards. Uh, so, you know, that might have just been something that slipped through quality control or whatever at this level. And um, the rule book itself, hmm. I know I had some fussiness, I always do, about the rules. Uh, this is a fairly simple CDG. And it was actually one of my worries was, oh man, you know, the paths of glory, twilight, uh, 
I'm sorry, not Twilight Struggle, uh, uh, Triumph of Chaos. Boy, those were both, you know, lots of stuff in them. And that's the family this is in, in terms of the type of uh, movement and, and, and card. Well, the way the cards are handled to some extent. There is one difference, which is the cards in this game. So this game doesn't do anything hugely innovative or breakthrough, but it does have a little, couple of tweaks. And one of them is with the cards with the months on every single card so that they enter at that. And that gives you a tighter reign on the history Maybe unnecessary in some cases, but I don't know. It kind of constrains the game a little bit more, and that may be a good thing. And it certainly makes it easier uh, to nail down, you would think, the uh, balance issues over, you know, a shorter playtesting time or whatever. So I would expect this to be more balanced than one that shuffled the cards together, all other things being equal, which of course they are. But, um, but the other thing, let me think, uh, with the cards, is that you reshuffle your entire deck. You know, and maybe I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> I checked and I checked. But you reshuffle your entire deck um, every time a round happens. This is spelled out here. Both players add that month's cards to the respective reshuffle deck. After this, they shuffle together the reshuffle and the cards left unused in their draw deck. So you get a complete re-randomization of, of your deck. What that means is that you have um, less control over the sort of the pattern. You're going to be doing some card management in this game. You're, you've got some cards that have low numbers on them that maybe you don't really like all that much. And if you could expend them and get them out of your deck early in the game, uh, and not all of them come early in the game, so obviously that, it might be worth your while. On the other hand, the points in this game, remember I said this is a simplified CDG of the uh, Pats of Glory version, uh, flavor? The points on the cards do you only one thing. They allow you to point to a space and activate the units in that space. You're not getting any reinforcements off those points. Those are handled otherwise. Uh, you're not going to be doing any diplomatic actions or anything like that. You've got a choice between moving units and taking the event. Now that's may sound like, oh my god, that's so simplified. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you're not, you're not facing the kind of really painful decisions that sometimes, you know, where you have this multitude of different choices. Just making sure that my video is working here because this would really suck and I'd have to start over. Uh, <laughs> um, you're not facing the kind of decision uh, space that you're facing in a Paths of Glory, and certainly not the kind that you're facing in Triumph of Chaos. That has a bonus and a downside. The downside is you don't have as much of a complex decision space. It's probably going to feel easier, uh, maybe not as challenging, to play this. The upside, this is a really nice and easy to learn and bring somebody into the CDG world. Now, you could say, well, Twilight Struggle is kind of that way, 1960, sure. Uh, but for military um, subject matter, where it's really you know, focused on a conflict or whatever, uh, that's pretty rare. Um, there are some lighter ones that feel less military, but they're still military subject matter. So like Unhappy King's Charles is fairly light, but... Yeah, it feels kind of generic <laughs> if you're kind of bumbling around um, in, in, in a different sort of way. And the decision making is more difficult, but, and it is actually heavier in that sense, but you're left with, you know, things feel kind of generic in terms of the counters. Now, the counters here are not all that, you know, differentiated. All the, all the red and white guards are these two, three uh, combat value movement, but you do have some differentiation. You have the Jaegers in there, you've got the German units, you've got the armored trains, and they all have their own little special rules, but they're not this overwhelming burden of special rules that like, you know, if this was your first CDG, you probably wouldn't want to face that much complexity. Here, it feels fairly clean and easy. The rule book is small, and it's sparse. I like sparse rule books. It's um, 16 pages, which doesn't sound tiny, right? But there's a lot of color, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, 
images, examples, and stuff like that. Big, big, big. Probably be half that size. And it's also in a large font. Uh, point size, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I uh, you know. I just hate when I make mistakes. So, you know. um, yeah. So, if you looked at this in like you know the SPI format of rules, this would probably be like a six-page rule book. You know, um, and I always put everything in SPI format, right? All right. Maybe less. Maybe less. There's a lot of a lot of images and stuff in it. And I, mainly, I don't look at that kind of stuff, but I assume that it's helpful to newer players, uh, first learning things. I know that I kind of wanted examples more when I was first learning um, general kinds of play. All right. Uh, let's think a little bit more. I want to look over the sequence of play. So, you've got a short number of turns. Uh, what is it? Five turns, something like that, or five or six turns. And they call them rounds here, but in other CDG parlance, they are turns. Yeah, five. Um, and one of them is very small. <laughs> and each of those uh, uh, turns, which are rounds, comprises of eight card plays, except for the first one, which is only three. That's a few more cards than most CDGs kind of give you for a hand. Uh, so you have a little bit of flexibility there in terms of how you're going to play out your hand that's a little larger in, in some of them. It plays out fairly quickly. Uh, I did find, oh, with the components, I used uh, some of the blank counters to mark the units that I activated. Um, you probably want more little markers of that sort, just as sort of a mnemonic device to, to remind you, yeah, you know, that guy moved and now he gets the fight. Because you do first your movement and then you do your combat. Um, combat is fairly simple. You add up the factors that are attacking, the factors that are defending, and it's a firepower table. I always like firepower tables. Where you compare your, your total number of values, you make a roll, and that's how much damage you did, and the opponent does the same. And, uh, you know, a firepower table is essentially similar to a buckets of dice type system. But maybe less of a smooth curve, <laughs> which means more randomness. I like a lot of randomness in games. Um, and you take your hits. If you, if you do enough damage, uh, if you do more damage to the, the defender than you took, you chase them out of the space, and with the exception of the important towns where you have to do two more damage. Not that big a difference. There are things that modify the combat uh, column, that modify the dice. They are largely coming from the cards. There are a few exceptions, though the fortification spaces, and some of the national qualities. So, uh, yeah, like the German units have all kinds of bonuses. The Russian trains, I don't remember how much bonus the Russian trains had. Yeah, they just don't get affected by supply. Um, you have bad terrain that's hard to get units over. Uh, the old, and that gives you a penalty to the die roll, which can be a pretty significant effect, but that can be negated with Jaegers or Germans. The red player doesn't have anything to negate them, though. Uh, the map ends up basically uh, putting you in a position where you find little bottlenecks that you can plug up. And there are quite a few uh, that might keep the white player alive at the beginning of the game, but they also help the red player to maybe hold the white off from a final victory at the end of the game. Mm. What else? Let us see. Like I said, there's not a lot here in terms of the rules, but it gives you an opportunity to play out the battle, to play out the war in um, a fairly 
you, you have a, a fair amount of flexibility as to, as to your strategic goal. There's a fair amount of variance in terms of what cards, what the luck allows to happen, where you can be put in situations you weren't expecting. Um, you check supply at the... Uh, I'm not going to go over all the rules. Uh, Issues. There aren't many, but there was one that focused in the in the supply sector. But it wasn't clear. Uh, how you. Um, how you exactly determine the supply that wasn't well spelled out. And if this so I think this game shines as kind of an introductory CDG. Um, not, you know not like 13 days or whatever. But if you want to get into the, I'm fighting on a board where positioning matters and all that, using a CDG, this is probably the best introduction I've seen. And if it's going to be taking that spotlight position, <laughs> I think the rules have to be just a little bit clearer, just a little bit more nailed down than they are. Because the only way that I was able, you know, basically there were rules that I could read one of a couple of different ways. And without a little bit of thought and uh, an understanding of point-to-point -point movement principles and all that kind of stuff, I could see a newer player just saying, hmm, and doing it the wrong way and just being like, wow, this just doesn't make sense, and getting some really weird situations out of it. So they have to be named down a little bit better than they are. Um, and I'm sure they will do that given that they asked me to try to point out things like that. Uh, so, yeah. Um, overall, like I said, I think this is a really good intro CDG. The other big selling point to it is, I don't even know of another game, I'm sure there's a magazine game out there, on the Finnish Civil War. As a whole, most of the Finnish 20th century stuff, hey, most of the Finnish stuff, is uh, either the, um, you know, the Russian invasion uh, early in World War II, or um, you know, before the Germans got into Russia, or the, uh, um, the, the, the attack coming out into Russia you know, during the war itself. And this is the only game I've seen on the topic. And, you know, I can't tell you a hell of a lot about how historical it feels uh, it, because it's not really the topic that I have a great deal, like any, knowledge about beyond this game. Um, there's no designer's notes or anything, which is kind of a shame because when you know, even if it doesn't come in a printed material, it might be nice to at least put an online link uh, to the information. Maybe that will be present on the Kickstarter uh, because knowing more about it is good. What you have, though, is a light enough, high enough level view without a lot of details going on in it that it's really hard to say. And, and it's a chaos, it seems to be a chaotic war, right? You know, revolutions tend to be anyway. Um, so, I highly doubt that it's going to really hit anybody as, wow, that just doesn't seem historically accurate, unless, of course, they're doing the supply the wrong way, but <laughs> in which case, yeah, it would seem crazy. Um, but within that, you know, you've got your historical flavor text and effects from the cards that gives you some feeling, gives you a little insight into the history. Um, that's where the units are kind of differentiated. They're all the same strength on here for the most part. Uh, but one specific unit may be better because you play a card and that leader's involved in that or whatever. And it gives you a bonus. Or you can look at it as, wow, the dice were really good on that unit. So it's a better unit this war. <laughs> it's an incredible unit, right? It always rolls a six. 
I know we've all got those kind of memories from games. You know, it'll happen here. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I, I think it serves what seems to be its design purpose very very well. Uh, how much does it appeal in terms of gameplay? Well, again, it faces you with an interesting topographical challenge, right, <laughs> and puzzle. There's these bottlenecks. I had a lot of trouble getting around them, realized that maybe I had given up too much ground with the whites, uh, but it still ended up kind of on that razor edge just because of the trump card of the, uh, the Germans coming in. They end up coming in behind the lines, which, you know, helped solve some of those errors. And it definitely makes it for a more, you know, a more interesting situation, I think, in some ways, because it's not just locked down into trench warfare because of them. Um, so yeah, I, I, I felt like that. Um, one, I know that I played one game, Gnome Skulls games, and I brought this up before, uh, Spania 1936 or something like that, where every move had a counter move. That's the case here, but you don't feel compelled in the same way to take that counter move. There's not, I didn't feel like there was an obvious um, need to respond to everything my opponent did. Um, first of all, my opponent could make mistakes, but secondly, we have kind of diverging goals to enough extent. Um, the white player has to take four of the five special cities until the last turn, at which point he has to take all five. And he has to hold them through the red player's turn. The red player has to take one city. Vasa. Uh, on the west coast. Um, and the fact that they have a differing nature of uh, goals, that it's not like uh, in the Spain game you basically had to both take the same, you know, you, you each had to get the same kind of level of control over Spain. In this, because there's an asymmetrical victory condition, um, it means that each player could be pursuing a strategy that seems significantly different. You still have to defend whatever it is that's the main goal that the other guy's trying to attack, but you don't necessarily find yourself in a position where Ah, he made a move there. I have to counter that move right now. You can put some delay on as you pursue your own plans. And that pleases me. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what it, you expect in a war game. You don't expect it to be, eh, he did A, so I have to do A too, right? Anyway, um, like I said, I think it, it, it meets its, you know, design attempts properly. I think it's going to be a good enough game. I think the history is fine. Uh, how strong is it? You're not going to get a really good, you know, understanding of operational tactics or anything. Yeah, it's the chaos of the Civil War. You're really not going to get that much. It's at a high enough level with the CDG side of it that I don't think you're going to get a huge historical bonus from a game like this, but you do get a nice, uh, a nice game challenge, and it's set in a believable historical uh, background. Believable in the sense that there aren't all that many details, you know? Uh, and you could say the same about uh, A House Divided, for example. That's, that's a good comparison. A House Divided is a perfectly fine game. It seems, you know, to give you reasonable results. But if you want a lot of detailed um, insight into how, how the war was fought, nah, it's giving you more high level feel. And that's what this does. Um, which I'm okay with. You know? <laughs> uh, I, I certainly don't feel like I really want to go into so much more nitty-gritty little pieces, because I think if you did, with the level of chaos of this kind of conflict, you'd get something like Triumph of Chaos, which I don't feel gives me much insight either. I feel like it just gives me more story. <laughs> All right, let's send it up.